Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. In this episode of Garden DC, we're talking to Holly Walker and Sarah Dykert, uh, both of the Smithsonian. Holly is an entomologist. Sarah is a horticulturist. And welcome, Holly and Sarah. Hello. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. Thank you both for joining me. So it's a little unusual uh, this episode that we have two interview subjects. So it's like two for the price of one <laughs> of expertise. <laughs> and our overall topic is butterfly gardening or gardening for butterflies. I always think when I hear the the title butterfly gardening that somebody's going out and pinning butterflies you know around onto things <laughs> that would be one way to do it uh but not what we're going to advocate for in this instance <laughs> no no not at all <laughs> all right so um holly why don't we start with you and uh talk about how you um got into horticulture in the first place or um your background and how you came to smithsonian uh, for me, it's been kind of a meandering path. I'll be very honest to say that I didn't think I always wanted to do entomology and horticulture. I, I think I've had many dreams of being a teacher at one point in time and then a marine biologist for a long period of time. But it was interesting because I think it was mostly when I got to college, I, for my undergrad degree at University of Delaware, um, I kind of got exposed to uh, some really interesting jobs doing um, seasonal work. And, you know, it was just kind of neat to have this relationship with particularly insects. I, I, one of the jobs I got hooked up with was um, working for a USDA lab looking at invasive species, but particularly insect invasive species. And it kind of created this passion of both being in the lab and being in the field. And even after I left undergrad, I kind of kept going in that vein, um, working with native pollinators and bees, but also working in crop ecosystems. And one of the things after I left undergrad was I did a year-long internship at Longwood Gardens doing integrated pest management. And this was just such a you know fascinating place to be and to really kind of see how these biological controls work in these really beautiful gardens and ecosystems. And it just really kind of brought that back to me. Um, so I went to grad school eventually after jumping around to a bunch of other biology jobs and decided to specialize in um, entomology and particularly plant insect interactions. And I went through to get my doctorate and the Smithsonian was actually my first job finishing my PhD. Wow, what a great first job out of out of PhD school. Absolutely. <laughs> That's great. And then uh, uh, great to hear about your background at Longwood Gardens as well. There's so many of our expert guests have shared that experience of, of being either um, a current Longwood student or have gone through one of Longwood's programs, they're, they're definitely, a, you could say, a, a breeding spot for great um, horticulturists on the East Coast, at least. Yeah. And Sarah, how about your background? So I, uh, as a horticulturist, my, my start really, I guess, came from my, my dad. He's a horticulturist. And Though admittedly, I was not one of those kids that was always outside in the garden playing with flowers, like many people have kind of their story. He did impress me fairly regularly that he would be able to name plants by their botanic name and their common name. And I just thought that was incredibly impressive. Um, so basically in high school, as I was thinking, what am I going to do when I go to college and what am I going to do for the rest of my life? Uh, I sort of thought about that. And um, I was, I grew up with some neighbors that had really nice backyards. And I said, you know what, I wish I could give everybody nice backyards like I had to play in. Uh, so I actually went to Penn State and my degrees in landscape contracting, which is essentially residential landscape design. Um, at, but as I was in the program, though, I really liked the, the, the horticulture side, the design aspect, uh, I realized I did not actually want to design people's backyards. Uh, and the work that kind of goes along with that. Uh, and thanks again to my dad sort of said, well, why don't you try public gardens? Because it was something he knew about being in the field of horticulture. 
And so actually my, uh, one of my first, or actually my second internship out of college was with Smithsonian Gardens. So I came to love Smithsonian Gardens as an intern, um, left there. I worked, did some retail garden center work for a while. And then I spent a few years working at a private country club as a horticulturist. And then a few years ago, saw that there had an opening for horticulturists with Smithsonian Gardens again. And I said, hey, that was a great place to be an intern. Seems like a great place to work. So I applied and here I am. Great. That's almost full circle. And do you work with uh, interns yourself now? I so I've recently uh, moved to be the horticulturist for the Air and Space Museum. Previously, I was at mm -hmm. the Hirshhorn. Uh, and so I haven't had, because of being the horticulturist for the Hirshhorn, haven't really had the opportunity to take on an intern, uh, just sort of due to the nature of that garden. It's not um, perhaps as a robust of an experience as they might get working at American history or natural history. Um, I had been at American history as an intern. Um, but I'm hoping that now that I'm at Air and Space, it's uh, for anyone that's in the DC area, they know that half of the building is under construction and the rest of the building will also be under construction in a year or two. Uh, so hopefully as the new landscape goes in, it'll be a, a good opportunity to take on some interns and hopefully give them the same experience that I had, which was a very positive one. <laughs> That's great. And I, for those who have visited frequently the Air and Space Museum, and sometimes I'll point out some of the native plantings there when I bring a friend from out of town or, or next door at um, the American Indian Museum, they're always surprised that there are gardens there on the National Mall. <laughs> and, yes, uh, that's, so that's a common there, surprise <laughs> for mm -hmm. many people. <laughs> yep. And that, and that museum in particular, you know, when you look at it from the front, just seems like it's the flat front of one building and that you don't even realize how tiered and how, how much footage there are. Do you have like a acre estimate of how many gardens are around that one museum? Oh, goodness. I really, I actually don't, <laughs> I don't know what the <laughs> kind of footprint is. Mm -hmm. um, Two-ish? I, I, I don't even know if I could put a number on it. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably more than what I think it is when I, if I actually get the the measurements, <laughs> like I'll probably be like, whoa, that's how much I'm taking care of. Um, yeah, it's, it, I think it would surprise a lot of people that even not even just at air and space, but like you said, kind of all of the Smithsonian museums that we have gardens around them and that sort of the intent is people are able to have a museum and garden experience before they even walk into a museum. Um, but we're, we're, I think people are starting to take notice more and more, um, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. And now, particularly during this COVID pandemic period, um, I think that is really important in that that was the one aspect that people were able to experience um, during most of the shutdown. So some of the museums are slowly opening um, in coming weeks, not air and space. Anybody, anybody uh, yeah, listening not, to yeah, that? Right. yeah, not air and space, <laughs> but some of the other smaller ones are. Uh, but otherwise, you were still able to go down to the mall, um, jog around, you know, bring small kids and, and look into the gardens, if, if not go into them themselves. Yes. I mean, that's really one of the nice things about our gardens is that um, we are, perhaps for better or for worse, open 24-7. Um, so people can really enjoy our gardens any day of the week, any time of day. And so I, I hope that people, especially, you know, people that are local to the DC area were able to, to get out and walk around our gardens during the pandemic and um, find some joy enjoying them, uh, even if the museums themselves weren't closed or were closed. Mm -hmm. And, and Holly, your title, aside from being an entomologist is plant, is it IPM specialist? A uh, plant health specialist, but it mm -hmm. falls into that same track, which is integrated pest management. Great. And for our listeners, we did a previous episode um, at, on IPM, integrated pest management, but uh, could you give a quick definition of that, that for people who might have missed that one? Sure, definitely. So um, integrated pest management is kind of a system or way of going about dealing with um, pest issues that you might have in a landscape or in a garden setting. And what it does is it kind of looks at the um, different ways in which you can handle it that doesn't refer to doing the most toxic thing right away. It's always been described to me as kind of like a toolkit. 
Uh, you don't need to use the hammer for everything. Um, and it, I like it because it allows you to kind of assess, you know, the problem uh, from many different perspectives, including looking at it from like a very biological perspective, which you should given gardens. Um, but you can do things such as biological controls. You can use mechanical controls, which is pulling plants or moving plants. You can also do cultural controls, which means selecting plants that are more resistant. Um, but then of course, there's also the chemical side of things, but it's often using targeted chemicals or things that are gonna have the least amount of impact on non-target species, definitely try to protect pollinators and also timing. So it's really a conscientious and tries to be an environmentally friendly practice of pest control in gardens so that you're not constantly wiping out the good guys and creating more problems for yourself. Hmm. I was just talking with another gardener who had a serious deer issue and rabbit issue about trap crops and um, how some farmers plant a field, say, of corn uh, to the side and that would attract the deer and then um, the rest of what they're growing is left alone because the deer are uh, busy with the corn or if say it was rabbits busy with the patch of, of clover that you might have to the side of your vegetable garden. Uh, do, you, do you do any trap cropping? So the interesting thing with the Smithsonian Gardens is we don't actually get a lot of what you consider like large animal um, herbivores. Most of ours are smaller insects. And while we don't particularly use, have to use a lot of trap crop cropping in our, um, in our gardens, it is actually a really good technique, um, especially if you're in a suburban kind of urban kind of um, landscape where you back up to woods or a park or something like that and you have wildlife that are coming in that way. Um, but again, you can actually use trap cropping for insects as well. Um, I know a lot of people do it with flea beetles in particular, uh, but you know, you just kind of have to look into what kind of pest that you have and then try and find those species that, you know, they're preferred to and what, and also put into perspective what you're trying to protect. The other side of it is, is trap cropping can be great, um, but also realize that it may not completely stop them from attacking the plants that you don't want them to get into. Uh, it's not necessarily a fence or a barrier uh, and they can still find your preferred plants and chow down on those as well. So it's just a matter of, you know, what you're capable of tolerating and also, you know, how much you're willing to let them be in your garden. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not like we can communicate with a giant arrow and say, eat this, not this, <laughs> but, but please do so. Um, yeah, especially for our vegetable gardens. So speaking of um, edible gardens, so we have a few around the mall, particularly the American History Museum and the American Indian Museum. Um, are either of you, Holly or Sarah, involved in those at all? Uh, so part of my job in particular is I go to all gardens. So um, unlike a lot of our staff who are designated to maybe a specific garden or they specialize in a special garden, uh, my job is that over the course of about two weeks, I visit each and every one of our gardens and reach out with staff and talk to them. And we touch base. And, you know, those two gardens in particular are of interest because obviously if these are food gardens and edible gardens. And just in general, we want to be safe with the things that we use. But particularly for American Indian, we have a more robust um, biological control beneficials program. Uh, same thing with the Victory Garden, which is that World War II vegetable garden is, you know, we want to show people ways that are safe and friendly to the foods that we eat or that other things eat, you know, so that we're not promoting a lot of heavy insecticides if we don't have to. Mm -hmm. And do you ever, and I hate to ask this, <laughs> have, have visitors um, grazing, and I'm talking about human visitors from either of those gardens? I think that's one of those things that comes with working with the public and having a garden that is open to the public 24 seven. I haven't noticed it too much. I'm sure some of the horticulturalists there might uh, comment a little bit more on that. But um, actually, I've, the American Indian Museum, their um, garden in particular, their food crops are meant to go towards the museum's cafe. So some of that is actually harvested and taken inside. So it's absolutely put to use. But, you know, I don't think that we'd have too much issue if somebody walked by and, you know, plucked a tomato or something along those lines. However, it would be a shame if they took an entire crop down. And we obviously want to defend for that. Um, here in space museum. So what theme is around that museum? Obviously, we're not talking about 
what we would grow on Mars, say, or right. another planet. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's most of the museums, the theme of the garden surrounding it is in some relation to what is inside the museum, but that's obviously going to be different for air and space. So I would, I would say air and space doesn't have maybe quite as overt a theme as perhaps some of our other gardens. Um, two years ago, uh, Smithsonian Gardens, we started our first campus-wide uh, exhibition and it, the theme is habitat. And so with that at the Air and Space Museum, we chose to have an exhibit themed around flight and sort of how nature has been an inspiration to engineers and inventors for forever in history and how that's really influenced um, the creation of things that we use to fly now. Um, so it's looking at sort of like how hummingbirds fly or sort of the the dynamics of lift and force and gravity that's that's put on birds or um, different seeds that may f are wind pollinated that kind of thing and sort of how different people through time have used that to to help them invent different um, mo modes of flight so that's sort of the the theme of our garden um, we do have uh, a lot of plants that are for pollinators and for birds. So it's kind of the connection that we have is, is being able to see, you know, we talk about birds on the different panels and then we have things like echinacea where you can see goldfinches coming and feeding and you can see them flying or say we have, um, we have definitely tons of milkweed. So you can see the little wind pollinated seeds that come out of the milkweed pods. Um, so that's really the, the connection that we have uh, for the air and space gardens around that museum. Yeah, that's a, a really clever tie-in to do there. And speaking of that habitat for the campus-wide theme, um, so that's um, talking about different habitat gardens, not necessarily for humans, but for the wildlife we want to attract to our gardens. And then there are some um, museum gardens like Natural History where there is a permanent um, pollinator garden. Um, so can you talk about some of the ways the other gardens around the mall adapted to the theme? I think in a lot of ways we were able to tie in the garden styles that we had into the the theme of habitat. So yes, natural history, we, are, we already had a, sort of a permanent exhibit about pollinators and pollinator gardening. Um, but then the, say the west side of that building has our bird garden, which I didn't really have um, any signage for it prior to the habitat exhibit, but it was always there. So really that was very easy to, to go ahead and add the signage, talking about nests, talking about the things that, that birds need to have a healthy habitat. Um, then if you go to the Ripley garden, you know, she has uh, Janet Draper, a horticulturist for that garden. I mean, she just has tons of different plants and she just has really over the years taken to heart um, providing homes and providing habitats for pollinators and insects and birds. And so her the theme of her exhibit is, is called Homes. And so again, it was a, a very easy tie-in because she was already doing a lot of those things. Uh, some of our buildings, we did have to sort of add exhibit pieces. Um, and that's kind of where we're get to today is at the Hirshhorn, we installed a Monarch way station. So that was not an existing piece of the garden. Uh, it's, uh, we intentionally added it for the exhibit and uh, we were able to install plant material and um, correlating signage in, there's some beds that uh, kind of are on the sidewalk level between the, the museum itself and the sunken sculpture garden, which is across the street. And so there's some, there's four beds there where we have uh, different plants that m basically monarchs need specifically, um, and then signage to go along with that. So for some of our buildings, we were able to tie in aspects that were really already there and just kind of add the signage and talk about some of the things that we were already doing that people probably didn't know know about at all. Um, and then the instance of the Hirshhorn, we were it gave us the opportunity to. Uh, really expand on what the garden offered both to visitors and of course to monarch butterflies. Hmm. And thanks Sarah and Holly, you, since you visit all the Smithsonian gardens, do you ever get out to the Smithsonian zoo grounds? And I know that there's a bit of like a home demonstration pollinator garden 
that I recall being not far from um, the panda house. So the zoo is actually one of, they actually have a different horticultural staff than we do. So that is one of the sites I don't get out to as much, but of course, being a broader Smithsonian, we try and get out there as much as we can just to see what they're up to. And they invite us out for things. And one of my favorite parts that sadly we haven't been able to do this year is we usually have like a fitness walk across the, uh, the Smithsonian wide campus. And we take turns where it's going to locate at. And my favorite one is always going out to the zoo and seeing what kind of new stuff they have going on. Um, but no, I haven't actually seen that exhibit yet, which, you know, I try to get out to as many of them as possible. Like I said, I go to all the different sites and, you know, I very much was lucky to be a part of some of this habitat design as well, uh, being the random entomologist out of a group of gardeners and horticulturalists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I can imagine they, they all turned to you at, at some meeting <laughs> and said, Holly, what specifically should we plant for um, attracting these specific pollinators? Um, so let's jump into it and, and talk about some maybe native DC area pollinators that maybe weren't coming uh, to the Smithsonian, to the mall gardens that are now um, being seen there because of what we planted. Sure, absolutely. Well, I definitely think with what um... Sarah has done, particularly with the Monarch Way Station, but you know we've we've been trying to plant for a while. I think the gardens have always been dedicated to you know providing habitat, and monarchs are such a big, well-known one. Um, but you know it's interesting. Our horticulturists actually really do dig into this idea in different ways. Um, we have one particular horticulturist who plants pipevine to support our swallowtails, and that's not a population that has done particularly well in cities. But by having this pipevine. Um, plantings throughout most of the um, the hop garden, actually, and some other locations, we all very much look forward to seeing the caterpillars every year. Um, they're just really kind of uh, showy in the sense that they're not brightly colored. They're actually very dark and usually like a brownish black, but they have these wonderful little sensory organs that when you touch them, you know, it comes out. They obviously are trying to scent defense, but we're not harming them. And it's just really neat to have this interaction with them. And it's usually close to the ground so that when the public comes to visit or we have education tours or, you know, kids groups, we can kind of get down with them and show them, you know, that there are insects all around us and that by planting these types of plants that they need, um, you know, we can bring them to us and we can create space for them. And that's one of the great things about insects in particular um, when talking about conservation, so, you know, most people, when they think about conservation, like, well, what can I do? You know, how, I don't really have a lot of land. I don't have a lot of space. You know, what am I doing and having any impact on the species around me? You can when it comes to insects. Even a very small space can have a lot of impact on the insect populations around you. And making small changes has a huge impact. So that's what I always like to tell people is, you know, first get them engaged, let them see the insects and show them that there's nothing to be afraid of and actually that they're really fascinating to watch and then sit there and go, okay, guess what? You actually can have an impact on this insect's life. Like you can create more of these just by doing very simple things. Hmm. And that's a really good point, Holly, is, is some of the public's trepidation or fear of some of the pollinators um, I know when I've done stories or covered, say, a honeybee haven or meadow, um, that there's usually I'll see in the some of the audience reaction a kind of grimace, not that they are personally um, allergic to bee stings, but just that they have a fear of bees and kind of lump all insects into that same category. I know all my poor insects. And, you know, it's funny because I'm a wasp lover. And I think a lot of people have issue with that sometimes. And it's really hard to show people that most of these species don't want to hurt you. I mean, everybody feels their way about hornets, yellow jackets this time of year and those types of insects. But um, I spend a lot of time trying to protect paper wasps. I think that they're important predators. Uh, cicada killers, often very intimidating. And we get you know, a good population of them actually on our gardens. And it, it's very alarming to the public, but I think a big part of what I do is try to educate people to show them that they're not about getting out there with you. One of my favorite things is I do a lot of bee programming um, and I like to do a lot of education outreach with that is showing people that I'm petting the bees. Now, I wouldn't suggest this if you're not comfortable with it, if you're somebody who's allergic or um, who has had stings. And I think that's a natural fear. None of us wanna be stung. We all fear an allergic reaction. Um, you know, we've had bad experiences. It's not fun to get stung. But at the same time, I think it's 
it has to be a very certain circumstance in which you do get stung. And that's what I try and show people. I've spent a lot of times with a lot of time with honeybees, um, bumblebees, native bees. I love showing native bees to people. I want people to see that there's this gorgeous diversity of bees and that most of these bees actually won't hurt you, can't hurt you in some cases. Um, not to say that they're stingless, but they're very unlikely to sting you and that it, it requires a certain type of action or environment for that to happen. Um, same thing with insects that generally people worry about biting. And obviously there are some that you should be concerned about, but if you're never, if you're not comfortable with it, just observe. That's what I always tell people. It's like, you don't have to touch something for it to, you know, for you to appreciate it. And insects are neat in the way that if you're calm, they're calm. I have stood in swarms of honeybees. I have stood right next to wasp nests and I'm calm and they get that. And they just kind of, they want to investigate you. Obviously you are a big predator who has moved into their sphere, but also if you're flailing at them, if you're making aggressive movements, they're going to react to it the same way that you probably would if an animal was acting aggressive towards you. That's so true. And I do like uh, your reference, Holly, to um, touching not being necessary. And a long time ago, I was a docent at um, the Discovery Room in Natural History. And one of the, the few signs in the room says, touch with your eyes. So <laughs> um, for the few things in the room that were out of reach or too, you know, too um, breakable for kids to for kids to be touching. So those were the touch with your eyes exhibits. So the same, of course, can be said for a lot of our wildlife that we interact with. Um, and Sarah, as a gardener, I wanted to ask your uh, insect experiences. Were you always comfortable with insects in the garden? I know sometimes um, gardeners never get over that fear. And then other times gardeners start off with that fear. And then, you know, two hours into their first weeding session, um, and I'm, I'm referencing some of my past interns here who weren't gardeners before and were, you know, almost deathly afraid of bees that they quickly got over it. I think I've always had a healthy respect for uh, insects and particularly bees. I mean, I have been stung multiple times. It's something that just kind of happens uh, when you're outside all the time. I think more than anything, I'm generally, I'll get maybe startled by say a, a bee or an insect where, you know, I'm, I'm working and all of a sudden they're in my face, especially this time of year, there's a ton of spider webs in our garden and I appreciate spiders and I want them there, but I also don't necessarily want them on my face. So sometimes it's very careful where I'm bending over to weed to make sure that uh, the spider is able to stay on his or her web and I'm able to pull the weeds that I'm trying to pull. Um, but I think exposure and being surrounded by insects really on a, on a daily basis has helped to alleviate any kind of fears or concerns that I may have had um, as a child kind of coming up, you know, the normal being scared of bee stings and that kind of thing um, that I'm much more comfortable being in the garden. And if there's a bee on the flower or near where I'm weeding, I'm not going to run to the other side of the garden. I'm okay working there and both of us, hanging out together in the same space um but you know i think there's still a certain amount where i'm like you know what you can be on the flower and i don't need to try to you know hold you in my hand <laughs> yeah and healthy respect is is definitely the key and um circling back to the monarch way station that that's at the hirsch horn um can you talk about a little sarah how uh monarch way station um I know that there's a, a national registry for them and also what you need to be a way station. Do you need to have food and drink and shelter or just one of those elements? Right. So um, there's actually a, an organization. It's called the Monarch Watch Organization, and they're sort of the ones leading the charge on um, hopefully getting groups or uh, individuals, organizations to install uh, what they call Monarch Way Stations in their gardens. Um, certainly lots of people out there advocating for um, helping monarchs, but they're sort of uh, a group that's, as you mentioned, uh, created the National Registry, which uh, the Smithsonian Hirshhorn Monarch Way Station is on there. Um, and they really define it as a way, kind of almost as like a monarch pit stop. So it's a place where they can raise their young, uh, as well as finding shelter and finding food sources. 
So uh, they do say that you can include water with that, but I would say it's not maybe as uh, necessary as some of the other components. So the, the big ones really are having milkweed plants, which are the only plants that monarchs can lay their eggs on it, that the caterpillars can eat. And then also having nectar sources, uh, especially for the butterflies themselves. The fall is really a good time to uh, have a good supply of nectar available for monarch butterflies because this is when they're starting their migration uh, to Mexico. So those are kind of the big the big ones is having uh, a fair number of plants kind of in your garden just so that they have a sense of security and a sense of shelter, having the milkweed plants, and then having uh, a variety of nectar sources available for them. And when you say milkweed, do you, do you mean uh, the common milkweed or any of the varieties of milkweed? It can be any of the varieties. So anything with the botanic name Asclepius really is uh, is included with that. I would say we do count only the ones that are native to North America. So there are some Asclepius that are native to like Mexico and South America, which when the monarchs are in Mexico, that's a source of um, that they can lay their eggs if they, they want to. But uh, when they're up here, we want to try to stick to the ones that are native to uh, North America. So for our area, we're looking at Asclepius tuberosa, which is butterfly weed. That's a pretty common one that you find pretty easily in garden centers, has uh, really nice like orangey and red flowers. Um, it also includes like the common milkweed and swamp milkweed. Um, there's also um, a world milkweed, which is a little less common to find in say a garden center, but we do have it in some of our gardens. Um, I believe we have some in the Ripley garden, um, that kind of thing. So really whatever kind of milkweed or Asclepius plant that you can find is what you want to add to your garden. Hmm. And for listeners, that's world, W-H-O-R-L-E-D, not yes. as in worldwide. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's, I know, that's a tongue twister to say. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a hard one to get that full to emphasis and pronunciation. And how many plants say, you know, you have a small home urban garden. Um, so if I did a small patch of milkweed of say three to five plants, do you think that would suffice or what do you think the minimum is? So the, if you're going by what the, org, the Monarch Watch organization says, they say a minimum of 10 plants. Now that's more for if you want to be a certified Monarch Way Station, if you want to have your, your home garden or your organization's garden listed on their registry. But for me, as someone who's a horticulturist and a home gardener myself, I think that having one to three is better than not having any at all. I will say caterpillars, when they're on the plants, they can chew down a small Asclepius tuberosa, the um, butterfly weed, pretty quickly. So having multiple plants available is going to be to their benefit and to your benefit. Um, but I think if you have a small garden or certainly if you only have like a, a like a balcony or a small patio, if you can only put even one plant out there, that's one more place that they can lay their eggs uh, that they wouldn't otherwise have. So sort of depends on what your motives are. If you want to be really official about it, uh, I think they, they say about 10 plants. But if you just want to do something, I think having one to three plants is a great way to start. Yeah, that's great advice that just even a few plants can help. And even if a monarch doesn't lay eggs on your milkweed plant, um, you can still share those. And And I've had on some of my garden listservs and Facebook groups, um, somebody will post, help, mine ate all the leaves <laughs> on all mine. Does anybody have spare milkweed? And some of us will go out and cut some and have those um, shared with other gardeners. Yes, so absolutely. That's always great. Yeah, especially I know uh, around the air and space gardens, for sure, the the butterfly weed, it's, I would not call it weedy, but I do find little milkweed plants uh, sprouting up many places <laughs> around the garden. Um, so it's a, it's a nice little self-seeder if you have room to do that, if you're willing to let it do that. And um, Holly, for the Monarch Project, are you involved in uh, the tagging of the monarchs and um, uh, keeping track of the migration and say the numbers from year to year? 
Yeah, so um, myself and some of our other staff uh, have gotten involved with the Monarch tagging and we encourage our staff, anybody who wants to be involved to come out there, but myself and another uh, co-worker, um, Sylvia Schmeichel, kind of led it up the last few years because I think most of them were a little bit afraid at first at you know grabbing a, a Monarch butterfly. We've all been taught not to grab butterflies because we don't want to damage their wings or uh, take the dust off them, that that can be, or those scales actually off of them and that that might injure them. So trying to train people on how to safely capture them, you know, having using a sweep net, how to carefully hold them, you know, how to put the stickers on, how to record the data. But I think people are getting much more brave with it. And it's definitely fun. We, we have a lot of fun getting people out there. We invite people out to come do these monarch tagging days with us. And yeah, it's such a cool ex experience. And we've only done it, I think this is be our second or third year. Now this year is kind of in particular, and this is just kind of a side note, I've been keeping up with the monarchwatch.org's uh, monarch um, blog, which is a really great resource. So they do the monarch tagging, they you know do the waypoints or the way stations, but they also have a blog that kind of talks about where monarchs are during that part of the year and what's going on with them. We've had such an interesting kind of funky year with everything. I mean, all of 2020 has been kind of a funky year, but we had that incredibly warm winter and then I don't know about you, but uh, we weren't seeing a lot of monarchs in the gardens for the first part of the year. It seems like only within the last couple of weeks, they've really kind of shown up. We're seeing a lot of adults. We're seeing a lot of caterpillars. And then I read something on the blog that was talking about the fact that actually the time to tag is going to be very short this year. And so we're kind of getting these cool nights already. And the things that trigger monarchs to start migrating, you know, they're not completely sure what all the triggers are, but it's things like, you know, the milkweed is starting to go away or, you know, the daylight, the length of the daylight cycles, but it's also temperature related. Uh, as an entomologist, you know, to me, temperature is so very important with insects. It indicates so many things for them. And, you know, we're getting these cool temperatures at night. So it's not surprising that we may not see monarchs as fully into October like we have in the past couple of years. Uh, we might actually see most of them head out, you know, here in the next couple of weeks. Now that said, we always have a proportion of the population that doesn't make it. And some of them do stay and they do pass away. And that's a normal part of it. Um, we're just hoping that most of them can start to make the migration down. So I'm really curious this year. We actually just got our um, tagging stickers in last week and we're gonna get our hands onto it in the next two weeks. That's really cool and that, that people can volunteer and be involved in it with you. Yeah, if people want to come out, like we have, we try to do it um, quite a few afternoons, but if, you know, especially with our staff, when we had interns, I usually have an intern each year, um, you know, or volunteers, but also we've had school groups come out, um, did some classwork with students at um, George Washington University, and they did a really cool field day with me, um, you know, just doing in general, like collecting Lepidoptera and identifying them, but part of it was the monarch tagging as well. So just trying to get people involved in this. And the neat thing is, you know, it's the, the stickers do cost a little bit, but it's very minimal. I think it's like $10 or something like that, depending on how many stickers you want to get. But it's a really neat thing. It's a, it's a really cool citizen science kind of project. And we, we can show people how to capture them so that they feel comfortable with it. Because again, I think that's most people's fear is that first time you have a monarch and you're like, okay, now what do I do? <laughs> yeah, and I do recall a few years ago that there were um, several monarch release events in downtown DC. Is the Smithsonian at all involved in release events and or do you advocate uh, having those or not? I haven't, not since I've been here. So uh, November will be four years here for me and I haven't done any of that. Uh, we haven't done that here. And I think there's some mixed views on that. Um, you know, obviously, you know, people enjoy raising monarchs and they wanna help. They wanna do whatever they can to support that next generation because I think we've all in the last couple of years really learned about that plight of the monarch butterfly. And this is our little way of kind of helping the world. Um, but some people say that, you know, they're not as healthy or that they might not migrate like the other ones. And I'm still kind of waiting to see where that research comes out. But, you know, one of the biggest things that I think and, you know, I see a lot of researchers say the same thing is the best way to support monarch uh, butterflies and caterpillars is by creating habitat. If you can create habitat or just reduce pesticide usage, you're going to do so much more for them than trying to rear them and release them. That said, if you enjoy learning about life cycles, I highly encourage that. As somebody who's been in academia and in the sciences, 
there is nothing better than curiosity in nature and engaging people in that because that's how you get people to care in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so we talked about milkweed, which is the food for the caterpillars to make the grown monarchs, obviously. Um, but we haven't really talked about the uh, nectar sources. So either Holly or Sarah, or maybe Sarah can talk about some of the plants that you've added and um, would advocate for local DC area gardeners to add for that nectar part of the diet. Sure. So I think the biggest thing that we would start with is starting with native plants. Um, I think that's the best way to help all kinds of pollinators, not just monarchs. Um, so thankfully, things like coneflowers, really any kind of cultivar, um, I would say try to stay away from those, uh, the ones that have like the fluffy sort of like double flowers, because it's a little hard for insects to to find their way to the nectar sources in those, but any kind of sort of, quote, regular uh, cone flowers are really great. Um, this time of year, monarchs are loving the solidago that's coming into bloom. Um, they're also loving like asters, and there uh, there's a plant called ironweed that's usually sometime in the in the fall or kind of late summer that's blooming. That's another really popular plant. Um, so I think that's a great place to start. Um, and I I personally also find that. Um, in many of our gardens, the monarchs really love lantana. Now that's not a native plant. It is an annual for us, um, but that is a very popular plant for monarchs. And I think when you're trying to have a way to provide them with nectar sources, especially all summer long, um, for those of us that have small gardens, there may be times when our perennials have sort of lapses in blooms, but you know, one plant may be done blooming and the next one hasn't started yet. And if you're able to even have maybe one or two kinds of annuals that they like, those are going to keep blooming really all summer long until till frost hits. And so that's kind of a good way to supplement them in between having uh, perennials that are blooming. Um, so I think in this instance, uh, you know, I, I do and kind of encourage using uh, not just perennials and not just natives, but having something available that they can chew and find and, and enjoy. Uh, kind of all summer long and into the fall. Um, but I think really there's a, an enormous selection. I know um, Anasysop, um, which is Agastache, that's a really popular one for monarchs. We find them on those a lot. Um, uh, another, actually another annual that's very popular is Tithonia, which is Mexican sunflower. So it's an annual, it gets pretty tall, so you kind of have to have a good space for it. But that's a really popular one for our um, monarchs and a lot of the other butterflies that we and other pollinators that we get in our gardens. Hmm. That's a great point that the annuals uh, kind of fill in and create that bridge for some of the short season perennials that only bloom for say two to four weeks or um, maybe go in and out of bloom. Do you deadhead your um, cone flowers and other perennials to get a second wave of blooms or do you leave up those um, heads for, so you have seeds for the birds? I do a, a little bit of both. <laughs> um, sometimes things on cone flowers, you'll get like a couple stalks that just like really get brown and kind of yucky looking. So admittedly, those I will sort of deadhead and sometimes I'll go through and, and deadhead a few to help uh, push them to get kind of that second flush of flowers. But for the most part, I try to leave as many of the seed heads as possible. The gold finches lately, I've have really been enjoying our cone flowers around the air and space gardens. So I, I, I can't bring myself to, to deadhead the cone flowers too much because I know how much they love them. So I sort of find a balance between a little bit of aesthetics, but also making sure that our, our um, friends in the, in the garden are able to enjoy them. Are there any um, shrubs or trees that act as nectar sources for the monarchs? I think some things you could do would be maybe like clethra that has a, a sort of more of an extended um, bloom time. Um, a lot of times shrubs have shorter bloom periods than say a lot of perennials or annuals. So I think certainly if there are some that bloom later in the season, um, that that would be certainly a, a good option for them. Um, but I think they're maybe not as a reliable source of, of nectar just because they tend to have shorter bloom times than say like perennials or obviously having annuals in your garden. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe not necessarily for monarchs, but I do know my Caryopteris book. Uh, bushes, also known as like old man's or beard or blue beard, mm-hmm. those are covered in bees and pollinators right now. That's just like I just call it the bee ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, landscape. no, that yeah. is a good one, and um, that we don't have any of that around the Air and Space Garden, but you're right, that one is does have a pretty like nice long bloom time. So I think that would be a great plant to to have in your garden to help to have a nectar source available. And Holly, um. Are there any nectar plants that that you recommend for monarchs specifically or butterflies in general? Oh, butterflies in general. As an entomologist, <laughs> I just, I, I mean, I love monarchs. They're great. And I did want to point out, there's a really great guide if you're looking for monarch nectar plants through the Xerces Society. And for those of you who are not familiar with this society, they're all about invertebrate conservation. But what's neat is they break down your guides by your region, and then they start with native plants, and then they tell you like what part of the season that they're going to be blooming in. And they break it down by like perennial plants versus trees and shrubs. So really it kind of lets you kind of pick and choose what you need. Um, But for me in particular, I always try and think about things as an ecosystem as much as possible. And how do I get more, I guess, bang for your buck in the sense that I want to promote and protect as many pollinators as possible. Um, Love verbenas. I love anything Minarda. Uh, I have a very tiny balcony. I have lived the apartment lifestyle for a long time. And I have this like barely eight foot balcony that's very narrow and doesn't get a lot of sun. And yet I do everything in my possibility to stack plants. I mean, I've literally zip tie plants to the outside of my balcony to try and get more sun, more pollinators out there. Um, Trying to think what else. Pucaras are really fantastic. Um, Like you said, echinaceas said mountain mints are wonderful um just trying to think and then of course that's nectar but the other side of that equation is host plants and so that's the other fun side of it because i actually want to see everything grow and you know start from an egg if i can find them but so things uh that i try to do is you know i can't really do violets but i love going out and looking at violets because you get a lot of your um fritillary butterflies are raised on violets Um, You know, it's funny, a lot of our native butterflies tend to be more on weeds, things like dock and sorrels, but you can do things like the pipe vine, which is great for the swallowtails. Um, You know, you can also get things that are a bit cultivated. So your parsley, your dill, because they're another great like swallowtail plant that you can grow a lot of. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever harvested any of my parsley or my dill because the caterpillars get them every year, but that's fine. That's the sacrifice I'm very happy to make. And the other side of this, because, you know, when I talk about, you know, we're talking mostly about butterflies, but um, bees and uh, native bees in particular are thrown into this as well is, yeah, there are trees and there are bushes. Blueberry bushes can be very important. Uh, Button bush can be very important. Trees in particular for caterpillars, oaks, willows and cherries. And, you know, we want to see the butterflies, but also think about the fact that those caterpillars are so critical to many of the bird species we have here. That's what they're feeding their offspring in the spring, and they're a direct relationship to the birds that we have here. So promoting all of those caterpillars and having those host plants. And like I said, I I understand, like, you know, it's hard sometimes to add a tree when you live in a very urban environment or like me, you live on a, you know, apartment. There is no room on my balcony for a nice big oak. But I can appreciate that by protecting those plants or having them around or, you know, when you talk about urban planning, by having these things in place, I am actually promoting um, the ecosystems and habitats around me. And I love the the concept of zip tying even more plants than you could possibly fit (laughs) onto the side of your balcony. Um, That sounds like a great habitat right there. And of course, we can um, advocate for our our local parks and other public spaces where there can be spaces for trees. So through groups like Casey Trees and um, volunteering at public gardens and volunteering for tree planting uh, initiatives. Absolutely. I think that's one of the best things is when you get people involved, not just on their own personal scale, but at a community scale. Um, it makes people feel more connected to the environment, but it also connects them to the people around them. Mm -hmm. And um, since we're talking specifically about butterfly gardening um, in particular, are there any uh, butterfly exhibits or shows, uh, this is of course pre-COVID and hopefully post-COVID, in the area that you recommend visiting? Ooh, well, of course, natural history has the um, the butterfly houses. 
uh, or the internal ones, but those are mostly tropical species. Though I do think it's interesting to go inside and look at the chrysalis and kind of look at the different life cycles. Um, I know other gardens in the area have similar things. And I, I also think that there is something to be learned from looking at natural collections that might not be alive, but can get us to appreciate the other species that are around. There's a lot of species of butterflies that they just live in environments that we aren't going to always be exposed to. There are butterflies that actually hang out at the tops of trees a lot of times, and you just don't see them. So, you know, sometimes there is something to be said for these old taxonomic natural history collections, because they show you a lot of beautiful things that are around you that you don't always get to see. But um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else regionally Obviously, I want people to come out to gardens. I want them to see our gardens, but I think that it's a really good idea to go to any garden and just try and look a little closer, see a little differently. Hmm. Thanks, Holly. And, and Sarah, did you have one or a few to add? Uh, you know, I couldn't think of any off the top of my head. I mean, I feel like a lot of public gardens often have an area that they kind of call their butterfly garden. So I think as you're out and about, even um, local parks sometimes will have sort of a volunteer-led, um, you know, butterfly garden that they've created. So I think, though I can't think of off the top of my head at the moment, I think if you're out and around and visiting gardens, um, check it out, look and see what they have, or certainly like ask the docents or the, the horticulturists that work there. I think they would certainly love to talk to you about it, uh, even if they don't even have a specific garden. I'm sure they'd be happy to tell you what they might have to um, help support butterfly populations. Yeah. Hmm. And um, speaking of visitors to gardens, so Sarah, you're out a lot and, and working in the garden. Do you get stopped by visitors asking questions about the plants and the insects? Uh, we do, definitely. Not so much this summer. <laughs> um, certainly less people walking around, um, but certainly a lot of people that we, being on the National Mall, we really have visitors from not only all over our country, but visitors from other countries as well. So certainly someone that's coming from the Midwest or from the West Coast, they're going to see plants in our gardens that they have they don't see in their day-to-day -day gardens or the public gardens that they might have around them. So I think that's always a fascination. And it's also kind of fun when you have um, visitors from other countries where they see a plant that is native to their country and we're growing it as, you know, an ornamental in, in our gardens. And I think, um, I think there's a real appreciation there to see that, you know, we've taken a plant that maybe is very commonplace for them and we're um, really using it to, to, as a highlight and as an exciting, interesting addition to our garden displays. And so I think we certainly get comments from, from people that are like, oh, I have that at home. Um, and their home is not America. <laughs> um, so that's, that's really fun, and it's always fun to talk and, and chat with different visitors um, about their gardening that they do at home. Always lots of questions about their home gardens, um, and it, I'm always happy to talk to them about that. That's always really fun. Hmm. And that, that is so true that we have such an international and cosmopolitan city and visitors from all over the world um, that might not be familiar with the flora and fauna that we have here, but can certainly can contribute some of their experiences as well. Um, so have either of you, Sarah or Holly, um, been to where the monarchs overwinter? No. I have not. <laughs> it would be awesome. <laughs> I have not been there, but it would be, it would be awesome. They're, I've seen videos on YouTube and they're, they're magical just to see the videos. So I can't imagine what it'd be like to see in person. Yeah, I would love to do that at some point in time. I've made it down to Costa Rica, but I overshot them by a bit. But there actually are even places in Florida um, that you can go to down by the far ends of the peninsula when they're getting ready to make the cross across the water that I always thought would be kind of a neat thing to watch as they're kind of preparing to make that last leg of their journey. And of course, there's different migratory tracks. So if you're on the West Coast for some reason or you're visiting on the West Coast, you know, you can actually still visit parts of where they overwinter the Western portion. Um, in California and those parts of Mexico as well, like right at the border. Um, and I think that would be neat just to kind of like compare these different populations and where they are, but definitely would love to see this someday. Yeah, and it would be so cool if, if some of the monarchs you tagged here um, were to show up and you're like, that's my monarch tag. That would be so fun to see. Um, yeah, and so in wrapping up, we mostly talked about monarchs um, as our 
forefront example of pollinators, but uh, I'll start with Holly and then go to Sarah. Uh, is there a favorite pollinator? It could be hummingbird, bats, any other thing um, that you are a particular fan of and think that DC area gardeners should support more of a habitat for? I um, spent a lot of time doing studies, uh, particularly one summer up in the Pine Barrens, actually in the Cranberry Bogs, looking at native bee populations. And we actually are very lucky here. Um, there's a fantastic group of native bee researchers, including Sam Drogi, who does a lot of work in trying to get people more involved uh, with native bees and takes beautiful photography. If you've never seen it, just makes these absolutely stunning you know, takes these beautiful, stunning pictures of bees and just kind of lets people see a world that they don't usually see. And I feel very strongly about that. I enjoy a lot of our mining bees and our leaf cutter bees. Um, I just think that there's something wonderful about them. I am probably the only person who gets excited when I see perfect little round circles cut out the edges of our plants. I'm sure our Rosarian is not so happy to <laughs> see them, though she's very, um, she is very pollinator positive and actually designed our rose garden around pollinators. So I think that's such a great thing. And then there's one that is a little bit close to my heart that I think, you know, is often missed, which is moths. I actually love moths. I rear a lot of moths. Um, this year in particular, I reared two large Saturnid moths off of my balcony, um, our Prometheus moth and our Cecropia moth. And these are just big, lovely beauties. Um, and now these guys aren't usually associated with being pollinators, but there are moth species that are fantastic pollinators. And I wish they got a little bit more attention because they're kind of the underdog. Yeah, that's so true. We, we sometimes say butterflies and moths in the same breath, but because we're out in the gardens, usually during the day, um, and, and more interacting with the butterflies and they're the more colorful ones, you know, let's face it, human eyes are attracted to those um, usually. But I'm so glad that you uh, referenced Sam Drogi and his wonderful bee photography. Um, and for listeners, um, if you go to usgs.gov or just Google native bee inventory, uh, his photos are incredible. And uh, just yesterday I was looking at um, some of his photos of blue mason bees and how kind of metallic blue green uh, coloring they have. And it's just incredible. Um, if you haven't already fallen in love with the native bees from what Holly said, take a look at the photos and, and you'll, you'll be smitten, I'm sure. So Sarah, any favorite pollinators? I think I'm, I'm probably the biggest sucker for the butterflies. Um, I think that's what catches your eye the most when you're in the garden. And certainly as I was um, developing the, the Monarch Way Station at the Hirshhorn, um, even though I already knew sort of about the the plight of their their populations, I, I really gained a new appreciation for them. Um, and they're always so fun. Um, I think as a home gardener, I've gotten really excited about hummingbirds, which you kind of mentioned. So uh, I've had a lot of fun. I had a lobelia plant in the backyard, which it loved, and it even visited um, some of my zinnias and that kind of thing. And so they're, they're a fun thing to see in the garden, too. Uh, if you can see them, they're so fast. <laughs> Yeah, hummingbirds are so so fleeting, and you're like, just stay still for one second so I can take that photo of you and, and share it on Instagram. Exactly. <laughs> I had many failed attempts trying to get some pictures of our hummingbird that came to our backyard. <laughs> yep. So they're kind of little heartbreakers that way, definitely. All right. Well, thank you so much, Holly Walker and Sarah Dykert, uh, both of Smithsonian. And any final thoughts um, that you want to share with our DC area home gardeners in particular um, for supporting pollinators? I think just getting out there and um, getting in your garden and putting some plants out there. Less lawns, more uh, natives. Yeah, I would definitely recommend, I would say the same thing, which is, you know, it always seems like a daunting task, but it isn't. And just get started and you'll find that it, it piles, uh, not piles up, it it you add more very quickly as my tiny little balcony can attest to mm -hmm. and every little bit counts yes thank you for listening to garden dc you can become a listener supporter by going to anchor.fm 
backslash Kathy dash gents backslash support. For as little as 99 cents a month, you can become a listener supporter and we'll give you a shout out in a future episode. Another way to support Garden DC is to go to WashingtonGardener.com and subscribe to Washington Gardener magazine. For this week's What's Blooming in the Garden, I wanted to focus on one of the more overlooked bulbs that's brightening up a little spot at the front of my back border, and that's Sternbergia lutea, also known as the autumn daffodil, the fall daffodil, the winter daffodil, lily of the field, or yellow autumn crocus. It has so many common names, mostly we call it autumn daffodil, although the yellow color is daffodil-like, the bloom itself is more like a tall crocus. Um, It's not quite as tall as most of the daffodils, and of course it's blooming now in mid-September in my Mid-Atlantic garden. It's USDA zone 7 to 9, um, originating in the western Mediterranean, and um, goes dormant for most of the year, then it has some grassy, strappy-like foliage that pops up, and luckily I did not weed it out because I had totally forgotten about planting it in that front little border corner spot. Uh, I sourced my bulbs a few years ago from a vendor at the Green Spring Gardens fall plant sale. I remember going by her her booth and display and seeing a big bucket of just uh, dry bulbs and a little sign that said autumn daffodil and I think they were a dollar each or so so I grabbed a handful decided to try it out not knowing what to expect and they actually bloomed fairly quickly after I planted them that year and have been um, re-blooming and multiplying pretty steadily in the last few years since then so I'll probably dig up this year's and divide them and put them in a couple other spots in my gardens so autumn daffodil if you don't have it in your garden I highly recommend it Plant Profile Radishes Radishes are the easiest vegetables to grow. This is the edible I recommend for anyone starting off a school garden or introducing their children to gardening. Not only is it super easy, but it's very quick to germinate and can be harvested in a month or so, depending on the variety. To grow radishes, you start from seeds. Pick a sunny spot in the early spring or early fall. You can also grow them in containers. Take a stick and draw a one-quarter inch deep line in the soil. Then gently drop your seeds in. Try to space them out as best you can. Seed tape can help with this, but don't get too obsessive about it. If the seedlings come up too crowded together, then you can thin them to make space for the strongest ones to continue on and grow to full size. Keep the radishes watered, but not overly saturated if it does not rain regularly. You'll know when to harvest them when their shoulders start to show above the soil surface but you can harvest them early and eat them if you like or leave them in the soil for an extra week or so. Just don't wait too long as they start to get tough and woody when left in the ground. Best to harvest them and store them in your refrigerator where they can last several more weeks for you. I like my radishes straight from the garden, freshly washed with a dash of salt. Some people like to slather on butter and layer them on a good bread for a radish sandwich. You can also slice them into salads and enjoy them in a stir-fry dish. There are milder forms of radishes if the classic cherry bell or French breakfast are too hot for you. Try some of the white icicle radish or watermelon radish. Some people say the more consistently you water and the faster the radishes grow, the milder their taste will be. Your mileage may vary. If your radishes are being chewed on, suspect slugs. Sprinkle some diatomaceous earth or sluggo around them. By the way, did you know that you can eat the radishes you thin out? The tiny radish thinnings can be added to a salad raw or on a sandwich. 
The radish tops foliage is also edible. I recommend wilting the radish foliage or greens and sauteing them in oil and butter and garlic to cut some of the sharpness. You can eat them raw, but I find them too strong on their own and prefer to add just a couple leaves in a mixed salad of milder lettuce greens. The seeds are also edible, so if radishes bolt, meaning go to flower and then to seed, let them. Then collect the seed to use the seed pods raw or in stir fry. You can also collect the seeds to use for next growing season. Be sure to label your seeds and keep them in a dry spot like a baby food jar. Radishes, you can grow that. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.